First thing is going to be electric shock. Death and or severe injury occurs whenever voltage pushes electrons through the human body, particularly through the heart. We've talked about this earlier, currents lead the power supply, and they're always returning what? To the power supply. There might be alternate paths, so we have current leaving the source, going through the light bulb, current leaving the source, going through the human body. Anytime you have current going through the human body, through the heart in particular, that's where the danger is of electric shock and electrocution. Hand to foot, it might be hand to hand that's connected to something conductive where the electrons are returning back to the source. The electrons are not going to ground. The electrons do not take only the path of least resistance. They take all the available paths, and the electrons are, are going to go back to the source, traveling through whatever is traveling through in parallel with the loads. So let's go back to our graphic here. Electrons leave the source, travel to the light, to the human being, because there is a conductive path back to the earth. That's the danger. Hand to foot, hand to hand, making contact with something that's conductive. And maybe Mike, who's with me here on the left-hand side of my hand here, um, maybe Mike will be able to make a graphic where on the, the left side of the graphic where you show hand to foot, we can do something more pictorial so you can see beside the one line diagram and also on the other one where it's hand to hand where you can see something more conductive. So we'll, we'll try to put that together to make it a little better. Let's go on to the next slide. Electric shock hazard of death and severe electric shock can occur whenever voltage exceeds 30 volts in dry locations or 15 volts in wet locations. Nobody knows whether it's 15 and 30 volt dry location, wet location is, and whether it's even true or not. But it seems to be what's out there in the industry that if it's over 30 volts, then it's considered dangerous. And if it's under 30 volts in a dry location, it's considered kind of okay. That's where you get your class two wiring and power supplies on chapter nine. I think it's table 11 and maybe 11A and 11B. And then you get 725, what a class two circuit is. And so there is that 30 volt. And then when you get into wet contact resistance, it kind of drops down to 15 volts. But listen, if you are immersed in water, you're in a swimming pool, you're in a marina, you're in water, forget about 15 volts being dangerous. We're talking about small amount of voltages can put you in a state of panic or it can put you where your muscles are in parallel with the water, which is in parallel with the current flow. The voltage gradient can be quite large. So swimming pools, marinas, anything where your body is immersed in water is really, really a bad situation. All right, let's talk about further. The severity of the shock is dependent on the path of the body it follows and the magnet of the current. So these numbers I want to change, I think, in the future and just simply change these. Are, these are representing percentages of 1,000. So I'd rather just make this, like instead of being 100% of 1,000 being 100, make it 1,000. And if you go from your hand to your hand, it's what? 100% of 1,000 or it's 1,000 ohms. If you go from a hand down to your foot, it's 100% of 1,000, which is 1,000 ohms. So we'll redo this graphic here and just make them by adding zeros to everything. Well, what about your hand to your chest? Hand to your chest is 40%. So in other words, if you're leading on, let's say, a bar joist, and it's conducted back to the source, and you touch an energized conductor, well, it's hand to the chest. Well, now it's not 100% of resistance, it's 40%. Now, these are just numbers. Every condition changes because your contact resistance are a lot. But let's just say the standard is 1,000 ohms. Based on the standard, standard based upon this kind of contact resistance from your hand to hand is 1,000 ohms. Hand to your foot is 1,000 ohms. Hand to your chest is 40% or what? 400 ohms. See, it's the current through your body that makes the difference. But the current through your body is a function of the formula I is equal to E over R. Let's go to the next slide here. So the magnitude, the amount of electrons, is dependent upon the voltage and the resistance. Now, let's talk about voltage and resistance. For all practical purposes, we're saying the voltages are constant. It's a 120. It's a, a 277. We, whatever you see, like 120, 208, 120, 240, 277, 480, 347, 600, it's the lower voltage is the line to equipment grounding conductor or line to neutral voltage that we're talking about because you're only touching one. Now, of course, you could touch face to face. So if you go face to face, it's going to be 240, 208, 480, what have you. So to make it simple, I'm going to work off of 120 volt examples. So if the voltage is 120, then your contact resistance is 1,000 ohms, we could calculate the current. 
Well, if you go from hand to hand, it's what? 120 at 1,000 ohms. Hand to your foot, 120 at 1,000 ohms. Hand to your chest while you're leaning on something, well, now that's what? 40% or 400 ohms. So you can see as you reduce the resistance, what happens to the current? The current is going to go up. The greater the current, the greater the likelihood that you're going to have a problem when it comes to electric shock or electrocution. Let's look at an example right here. It's a 120 volt circuit. Electrons leave the source. They travel back to the source via the neutral conductor. However, there's a fault to the enclosure. And the enclosure is not connected to an equipment grounding conductor. The person makes contact between the hand and they make contact with the other hand to something that's conductive and then those electrons return back to the source. In that particular example, we have a 120 volt circuit and we have a 1000 ohm resistor, which is the human. And based upon that formula, I is equal to E over R, which is 120 over 1,000, we have 120 milliampers. Another way to look at it, plugged into an outlet, it's energized, goes to the heart, to the hand, that's hand to hand, that's 1,000 ohms, and that returns back over to the power source. Now, I'm going fast. It's, it's important that if you, you're catching pieces of this, but not the whole thing, l go through the whole DVD as far as the section is concerned. Maybe go back to it a couple of times, ask some instructors, or maybe it, or, or somebody else, or, you know, or get the DVD that I get into details in the grounding and bonding. All right, let's go a little further there. But before I do that, take a look at this particular graphic. Hand to hand is 1,000 ohms, 120 volts is 120 milliampers. That should mean nothing to you other than, hmm, 120. Wonder what that means. Well, here's what it means. If you're between 0.3 or 0.4 of a milliampere, we're talking about three tenths of one one thousandth of an ampere, people are going to say, you know what? I feel a tingle. That, I feel it tingles. I, feel, I just feel something. If you start getting close to one milliampere, now they say, hey, I feel something, and they let go. We're like, whoa, hey, whoa, something's not right there. It's different than like, you're feeling a tingle, that's below a half a milliampere. One milliampere, then letting go, that level is around one milliampere. Now let's go to the next point here. Maximum let go, that's where you cannot let go. <coughs> this is the most you can go, and after you pass this threshold point, take a look at the graphic here, you are not permitted to let go. Females, the studies have shown, is a 10 milliampere. Above that, she cannot let go. And males, above that, he cannot let go. Now. It's not because women are more sensitive than men. I got five daughters and a wife, and we're not going to get into that whole thing. Okay. It has to do with mass. The studies that were done back in 60, I think it's USC, University of Southern California, and uh, Dazzler, Dazzler, whatever his name is. Huh? Cal Berkeley. Yeah, Cal Berkeley. And so he had his students. He, take the girls here. Grab this. Hold this. And let it go whenever you can. Well, at some point... You know, you see on the internet, you can see the pictures, and you see them all contorted. Eh, they figured, okay, couldn't let go of that number. Okay, yeah, we can here. Come up an average. They did the women in the class and the men in the class. Maybe today they don't like those kind of studies in your college class, okay? But we got the information. That's how we got the, the information on GFCIs, when it become a safe standard. The reason the females are 10 and the males are, are, are 16 is because the average weight of the female at that time was 100 pounds. The average weight of the male in that class at that time was 160. It's linear. So if you're 200 pounds, your let go threshold will be approximately 20 milliampere. If you're a little child that let's say 50 pounds, your maximum let go threshold is going to be about 5 milliampere. So let's go back to the graphic. Depending upon your mass is your let go threshold. Once you start getting into uh, uh, 50 milliampere, 50 thousandths of an amp to 75, now, depending on time, now you're going to get into what is called ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation is where your heart quivers. It, because, see, the heart has an electrical signal. It, the heart itself, you've seen movies where they pull the heart out and the guy holds up, the heart's bouncing like that. But that's true. The heart itself has its own power supply. It has its own signals. It takes care of itself. This is not something that's done by the brain. It's done by the heart itself. Well, if the heart has a power supply and it's sending out the signal to the muscles to get it to do what it's do, you get something to go past it in some way that you get the control circuit in there to get confused. It's trying to reset itself. It's, it's trying to get the thing right. And so it keeps trying to reset itself and it can't get there at all. The electrical signal in the body is 40 hertz. 
Electric power we work with what? 60 hertz in the United States. Europe is what? 50 hertz. Very, very close to the same frequency between the hearts and the brain, the way the electrical systems work in the United States. You know, everything we do in our body is all electrical. I mean, every, my hand moving, my muscles, my brain, my thinking, my eyes, my eating, it's, it, everything is, is an electrical signal. So when you bring a, a, a signal coming in at a certain frequency at the wrong time to the heart, as it goes past the heart, now you have ventricular fibrillation. So what, is, what are you trying to do? You're trying to use a defibrillator. You're trying to say, stop, stop. And then I'm assuming the defibrillator attempts to stop that signal, and it probably hits it again. And I don't know how they designed those things to try to get the signal going again. That's where CPR comes in. When a person's going through ventricular fibrillation, blood is not moving in the brain, in the body. So then you do CPR. You breathe in 21% oxygen. You exhale into that person 16% oxygen. You try to do compressions at a certain number of compressions within a myriad minute during a certain rate per compression status. Okay, that's, that's going to be CPR. Make sure you have CPR. And all you're attempting to do during CPR is not in any way to get the person to, to the heart defibrillating. You're just trying to move blood ever so slightly to the brain. Just move it ever so slightly because blood has the oxygen, brain needs the oxygen, no oxygen, the brain dies. So our problem in electrical systems is that if somebody gets a current traveling from one part of the body through another part of the body, it travels through the heart at a certain frequency, at a certain magnitude, at a certain timing, your heart can go to ventricular fibrillation and then you die. So we have to be very careful. 90.1 said what? The purpose of the NEC is the practical safeguarding of persons and properties arising from the use of electricity. So we need to understand well, what could cause an electric shock. Let's go a little further now. Now, we can use this in a different table to look at that. Electrical sensation, pretty small, less than a half a milliampere. I, I feel it. I'm not comfortable. One milliampere. Harmless. For most people, anyhow, 99.9% .9 of the population probably four to five milliampers with the range, you should be fine. You start getting above five milliampers, it's very, very painful. You start getting around 10 to 15 to 16, depending upon your mass, you might get to the point you can't let go. If you cannot let go, see, you're not gonna get killed at 20 milliampers, but if you can't let go, well, something's gonna happen here because you're gonna start sweating. What happens to your contact resistance? It starts going down. And as soon as you can go through the skin and you burn through the skin, Guess what? We're now into veins, right? We're now in the blood, which is an electrolyte, which is a conductor, somewhat conductive anyhow. You have nerves. They are designed to be carrying current, so you can imagine how the body reacts to that. You have the parallel paths of all the muscle fibers. So all of this is contributing, and it takes microampures to the heart to get the heart to go into defibrillation. We're not talking milliampures. We're talking about millions, about 50 millions of amperes through the heart the wrong time, the wrong frequency, if you can get it right to there, boom, we're going to die. So that's the danger that we have here. So how do we solve this problem with electric shock? Well, the way you solve the problem with electric shock is a couple things. How do we handle electrical systems? Well, we insulate the conductors, right? We don't want to be going somewhere. In other words, if you see a cover that's off a plate of a receptacle, is there a chance that somebody could put the fingers in there and contact the energized parts? We all know it's obvious. A switch, a receptacle. I'm sure you've walked around malls and shopping centers and streets and, and in public places all over the place, and you see conductors that are insulated that are being exposed. Now, because there's so, this happens so often, sometimes I think we become desensitized, not recognizing one touch for one instant can kill you, could put you in the ventricular fibrillation, and then you're going to die in a matter of a few minutes. So we insulate the conductors. Not only do we insulate the conductors, we put them in enclosures, and we require the enclosure to have what? To have covers and to be protected. And we make sure that we can isolate contact to those parts. However, even if we do all of that properly, there will be times that a wire through vibration, a connector coming off, the wire actually makes contact to a metal enclosure. Once you make contact with a metal enclosure, that's when we have to deal with it. We have only two ways to deal with it. Number one, don't do anything about it. Leave it energized. That means that if one enclosure is energized, that means the entire building could possibly be energized. Or two, 
if a conductor that's energized makes contact with a metal enclosure that could energize it and then expose it to people because the enclosures are supposed to protect people from making contact with the conductors, but they themselves could become energized because of a fault, then we have to turn off the fault. That's the only option. Let's look how we do that. Now, this is kind of a really, really busy graphic, but we're going to work the best we can with it. You have a transformer, and the current leaves the power supply, goes to the disconnected means of the secondary side. And let's say an amp meter is recording this, and there's 600 amps that leave it. It travels to the enclosure, and from the enclosure, it goes on the equipment grounding conductor to the supply side bonding jumper, over to the equipment grounding terminal that's now going to be required in the 2014 code, up the system bonding jumper back to the source. <coughs> well, if you put 600 amps, on a breaker, let's say it is a 100 amp breaker. Well, we are going to be tripping the breaker. So the concept of providing protection to people is to make sure that everything that's metallic is connected to an equipment grounding conductor. And we have to make sure that all the equipment grounding conductors are connected ultimately back to the equipment grounding conductor at the source, which is going to be your grounding terminal. And then we have to make sure that we bond that equipment grounding terminal at the transformer to the system, inside, to the system itself via the system binding jumper. If you provide proper equipment grounding conductors, proper terminations, proper connections all the way back to the source, that equipment grounding conductor, that supply side binding jumper, that system binding jumper, and all those interposing connections back there is called the effective ground fault current path. And that's how we get the electrons from that fault back to the source to open up that protection device. It's that simple. I don't have to go any further in grounding and bonding. They just simply say, make all the metal parts connected to the equipment grounding conductor, connect it back over to the equipment grounding conductor at the source, connect the source over to the neutral, bada bing, bada boom, we're done. Now, how fast does it take to trip the breaker? Well, if you have a 20 amp breaker and you have 40 amps worth of fault, this is called your time current curves. And look at the red one. This is the minimum unlatching time. It's expected. So 40 amps, manufacturers do this. The quickest you can have on a 20 amp breaker under a 40 amp fault, the quickest it's going to open is approximately one half of a minute. Now the maximum time that it would be expected to open is you go all the way up to the blue, maximum unlatching time, up and over, that's 150 minutes. That's going to be 200, that's going to be two and a half minutes, I'm sorry, 150 seconds, that will be two and a half minutes. So, a 20 amp breaker, if there was a 40 amp fault, would take anywhere between, anywhere between a half of a minute to two and a half minutes to open. That's just the way it works. But what happens if we can increase the, the fault so we can raise it from 40 amps, let's say, to 100 amps? Look at the time current curve. The minimum unlatching time would be approximately five seconds. The maximum is going to be 20 seconds. So now, if we have an effective ground fault current path, the lower the impedance, because it has to do with alternating current, if we use an alternating current, the lower the impedance of that, that, in, that fault path, the higher the current, the higher the current what? The quicker the device is going to open. Devices are not going to open instantaneous. It's called inverse time. The higher the current, the quicker the time. So our goal is always to do what? Make sure that the fault can be as high as possible so we can clear that fault as quick as possible. Well, there's no engineering design. There's no formula. The, this code just simply says, do it this way. If you follow the code, if you size the wires according to these methods, and if you terminate them according to these methods, it's going to provide the practical application that you need to clear that fault quick enough to make sure that it is safe. So we make sure we have an effective ground fault current path. Very important that we comply with the code, that we understand what a system bonding jumper is, that we understand what a supply side bonding jumper is, that we understand what an equipment grounding conductor is. We understand Article 250 completely. Nothing is more important than that to make sure that we make an installation safe. So that's kind of like some basics, and let's go a little further. Let me continue on the equipment grounding conductor. An example, you must bring an equipment grounding conductor to every single circuit every single time. There is no condition that we don't. And so if you had a parking lot light outside, then you'd bring an equipment grounding conductor and you would terminate it to the equipment grounding terminal of that pole. Now, it is a common practice around the country at places that they drive ground rods at poles. And if anybody knows me and knows what I think, I'm thinking 
This is nuts that anybody would drive a ground rod at a pole. And if you're watching this DVD and you don't understand why I think it's nuts, then you need to get the grounding and bonding DVD to have a better understanding. Grounding does not do anything to make anything safe from an electrical fault condition. Let me repeat that. You drive a ground rod, it will never make it safe. It doesn't do anything in the event you have an equipment grounding, you have a fault to a metal enclosure. The only way you can make it safe, let me go back, let's look at this graphic. The only way to make it safe is to do what? Bring, have an effective ground fault current path from the point of a fault back over to the source. That is all you have. There is no other option. You don't drive ground rods to make something safe. I didn't know that, though. I mean, when I was younger and I was teaching the class and when I was reading the books, all the books talked about grounding. Total, complete BS. So you do not drive a ground rod at a pole. Is it illegal? No, it's not illegal. The code doesn't care. 250-54 calls that an auxiliary electrode. You can drive a ground rod. It can be 8 feet, 4 feet, 2 feet. You don't have to have a ground rod. You can run 6-gauge wire to it. You can run Cat5 wire to it. It doesn't really matter because it's not required. My concern about it is that some people might think the ground rod somehow provides some kind of safe. Now, I've heard arguments for reasons why a ground rod. Now, here's an ex but here's what happens. If you have a ground rod and you have no equipment grounding conductor, which is a practice, it is a thought, and you have a fault, fault current will come to the pole from the conductor, and its only path is to return back to the earth. If the ground resistance was 25 ohms, if that were the case, and if the source is 120, then the current traveling through that circuit would only be 4.8 amps. You're not going to clear a fault. So looking at this graphic, yes, if you have a ground rod, it will carry current, 4.8 amps, if it were 25 ohms at 120 volts. But it, what it doesn't do is it does not room, remove dangerous touch and contact voltage. Let me repeat this. If you drive a ground rod, you're not going to clear a fault. You will have a voltage gradient in the earth that will kill you, and there's nothing that you can do about that. So now, take a look at this photo here. This is in Miami, a bunch of guys driving this very, very difficult ground rod into the earth there because it's coral rock in Miami. Uh, 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 actually, that was near coral, uh, uh, coral Gables. So obviously they call that city Coral Gables for some reason. And now people argue, well, Mike, the reason you have a ground rod is for lightning protection. If anybody's saying that, you obviously don't know lightning protection if you said that. So let's just start right there. You're just like, uh, for lightning protection because you don't know what you're talking about, Okay. Lightning protection means that you're protecting something. And if you're going to protect something, you're protecting it according to a standard. The standard is NFPA 780, okay, which is the National Lightning, okay, the, uh, National, uh, NFPA Lightning, Lightning Protection, Lightning, I guess Lightning Protection. NFPA 780 Lightning Protection. See if we get a right title. I know it's, I'm missing the title there for some reason. NFPA 780 Lightning Protection. I guess Lightning Protection. Lightning protection systems. Okay, lightning protection. The standard for the installation of lightning protect 780. If you're trying to protect something, you means you're trying to protect it. I have a house. I ha I'm just building a barn right now. I have lightning protection on my house and on my, my, my remote garage. Why? I don't want my house or my remote garage to burn down in the event of a lightning strike. So I put air terminals on that to capture that and to divert that away. If you have a pole outside, if you're saying, well, I want to protect the pole, and you put a ground rod at the bottom of the pole and the lightning, take a look at this graphic here. That bolt of lightning goes right through that pole. If you think driving a ground rod at the bottom of the pole is going to protect the ballast or the fixture on the top of the pole, then we got a problem here because that's not how it works. You don't drive something at the bottom of something thinking that you're protected. If that were the case, then go get a hold of NASA and tell them, listen, you guys are putting these three large towers around the launch pad so that lightning doesn't hit the launch pad. All you got to do is drive a ground rod on the bottom and connect it to the bottom of the rocket. You protect the whole rocket. Does that make any sense? What the heck would you drive a ground rod at the bottom of a pole? Okay, I got to relax. So... <clears throat> Here's a great one. This is my last one, and I'll stop going nuts. Let me see if I understand something. We got a 150-foot pole. We got these anchor bolts that are probably 15 feet in the concrete with a huge concrete cage. We got at least, what, 12 huge bolts in the And we have this cute little wire that comes down that probably goes nowhere. Are you kidding me? 
I don't think you understand how this whole thing works. You need to make sure you make it safe. What do you have to do? Bring an equipment grounding conductor. Connect it back. Properly terminate every single thing. Your equipment grounding, your wire nuts, your terminations, they need to be like rock solid. Back to the source. In the event of a fault, what? Open up a protective device. Have a low impedance path. Follow the code. And we're going to protect people. So that's my story. Any, I'm going to get comments before we get to the Yeah, code. just one. I think that, that whole series right there with the street light would also be very effective if instead of the street light, there were a process computer. <clears throat> machine tools? They drive around with well, machine tools. Yeah. Are you kidding me? What the heck you want to drive around a machine tool? But we'll talk more about that. Well, well not in this class because it's not grounding. Yeah, but the reason I say process computers, there's, there's a, say, in chemical plants, you have this, uh, for in, especially in the 80s and 90s, there was this thing called, well, you have to have an isolated ground oh. for our process computer. And you have the same exact situation as you do with the streetlights. That people are driving confusion. ground rods, isolated ground circuits, and equipment, and somehow... Right. Crazy. I don't want to get into all that. Is there anything I said that we could add to that part? Yeah, I, I was just going to mention real fast. Maybe we can send a newsletter on this. I just uh, I sent you the actual original study on the shock effects on humans that Charles Dazel did at UC Cal Berkeley. And uh, you know, it shows the pictures of the tests and people getting zapped, and maybe we'll send that as a newsletter. Yeah, I've had it for many, many years. And I got a lot of old stuff, some great archive stuff. That yeah. I tell you, stuff the guys did in the '60s and back in the in the '40s. Great, great engineering work. H human test subjects.